Now, I keep bees because they don't talk back to me and uh, they don't go to work late mornings and they don't have a pension plan. They don't call me, I'm sick. They're such interesting creatures. So I sold my other business and just kept developing my beekeeping business to the point now where that's all I do for a hobby and for my living. I keep bees because, uh, for the love of it really. Once I realized that without bees we don't have food, then I really decided that I would develop this and make it a real to-do because I like to eat. Beekeeping has become quite a big part of my life, or bees have. How they're such a social insect and every member of the hive has a certain role that they have to play. For the good of the hive, everyone has to do their part. A lot of lessons, life lessons, can actually be learned by watching the bees. All the way to Baylor's Bay, fish and taters every single day. They used to sing and dance as they went along. Singing a happy, but a teasing kind of song. Ah, ha, 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 yeah, man. The scientific name for the honeybee is Apis mellifera. Apis means bee, melli means honey, and fara means factory. So when you see one of these girls flying around on the flowers, they're nothing more than a honey factory. But they do a much, 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 much more important and bigger job than that. They pollinate our vegetables and our fruits so we can get more and better vegetables and fruit to eat. As a matter of fact, a third of what we eat on our table every day is a direct or indirect result of the honeybee. They're very vital to mankind's survival. My name is Randall Ferbert, and I'm a beekeeper of 38 years. My father was a beekeeper when I was a young boy. We only had three or four hives around the garden for pollination and so we could get some sweet for the family because it was a large family. But I had this fair bees, I would never go around them. But after I had started my other business, I decided that I'd have a hobby. And when I went to a convention once and I saw how these guys were making a lot of money out of honey, I said, well, I can do that too. I started in 1972. I still wouldn't go very close to them. But if you work with the bees, they'll work with you. After I got to know how to work with bees, I don't enjoy doing anything else more. It's a fascinating hobby to have because nothing's nicer than being able to give away a jar of honey. You can sell a jar of honey and the honey money is just as nice. I've had some very, very, very successful years as a result of working along with them. My name is Tommy Sinclair. I'm the Agricultural Officer for the Department of Conservation Services. I got into beekeeping about 18, 19 years ago. A friend of mine who was also a beekeeper asked me if I could help him to catch a wild swarm of bees. And that was totally new to me. I've never heard of it. Uh, so I said, yeah, sure, why not? And I was so fascinated by catching these bees and putting them in a hive that I said, I have to try this. And so he encouraged me to try beekeeping. And that's how I started, just by catching a wild swarm. See, did you see, can you see this? The bee just about to emerge, just walking out of a cell here, right there. This is live birth, people. When they come out, they come out fuzzy brown. Their sting is not well developed, so you can pick that one up. 
My name is Quincy Burgess. My occupation presently is self-employed. Uh, the name of my company, I call it Bonsai. My interest in beekeeping really started when I was in school in Oklahoma. I used to wake up six o'clock in the morning on Saturdays and sit down for three hours with a bunch of Tulsa beekeepers and learn about beekeeping just for the fun of it. In the area of beekeeping, what I do is education. Due to the recent bee crisis, a lot of people became more aware of the, um, the importance of bees, the plight of the bees, and so my goal is to basically facilitate that knowledge through my experience and what Mr. Ferber has taught me, what I've learned from other beekeepers and going to conferences, to homeowners, to farmers, to whoever, whoever really is interested, so that I can basically pass the information on. My name is Jenny Ferris and I'm 28 years old and I grew up in Bermuda and Randolph Herbert was my teacher. He's a amazing guy. I started in November. That was when the second honey flow was just ending actually. So I put on a suit and went out with him and a couple guys and helped harvest honey. He's helped me get equipment, all kinds of stuff. Now I have my own two hives here, which I created by splitting one of Randolph Ferbert's hives. So everything I've learned, I pretty much show to Uncle Rand. <laughs> it's just such an amazing trade. And to be able to learn it from a Bermudian beekeeper was like, wow, that's what I want to do. <laughs> On the historical point of view, Bermuda had the honeybee introduced in, I think it was around 1612 or 1615, around there. We actually had the honeybee before it was introduced to the uh, United States. So we've had bees around for a long time, and this was found in a document. Richard Rich, I believe his name was, and he was sending a letter back to his brother thanking him for the bees. They arrived safely and that the bees were doing well, he said at the moment. So that was, you know, centuries ago, and the bees uh, continued to do extremely well, uh, unfortunately, up until, you know, uh, it was around November 2009 when uh, the Varroa mite was first uh, found, and, you know, things have been a lot different since then. They all have different jobs to do. Some are feeding the queen, some are providing air conditioning, some are going to the flowers getting nectar, some are collecting pollen, some are acting as undertakers, taking the dead bees out, some are working on wax. They just have all different jobs to do, and they're all busy doing what they have to do. They work together in harmony, nobody fighting, everybody's doing what they got to do. And if mankind could live like the bees do, we would have a very happy community, really. And a hive that can be only three kinds of bees, many, many workers and several drones. And the queen's the only one in charge. It's one queen only. If there are two queens, they'll fight to the strongest survives. The worker bees are the female bees, and they're the only ones who sting. The drones are the male bees. A bee has three main body parts. It has a head. This part of the bee is called the thorax. This part of the bee is called the abdomen. Her Royal Highness has a bigger abdomen because she has to lay 1,500 to 2,000 eggs every day. Now a worker bee will have three pairs of legs, two hind legs, two middle legs, and two forelegs. The hind legs have little hairs on them. So they're basically used to collect pollen. Now a honeybee has five eyes, three what we call simple eyes, and two compound eyes. When I first started keeping bees, it used to blow my mind how they do such beautiful work in complete darkness. God has given them five eyes, I only have two. It takes 21 days before a worker bee is born, once a queen lays an egg. It takes 24 days before a drone is born. It takes about 15 to 16 days before a queen is born. Now when the hive needs a queen, they'll take one of these young larvae that's just right they'll feed that with royal jelly. And she'll develop, develop, and develop, come a worm down here, keep developing till she gets down on the 16th day. Then she'll break through here and go on a marriage flight. 
and the mating is done in the air. And once a drone mates with a queen, he dies, poor fella. She'll mate with about 10 or 12 drones, and she'll come back to the hive and she's able to lay up to 1,500 to 2,000 eggs every day. If she doesn't do that, I'll get rid of her so they'll make another one because the success of a hive is having a good queen. I'm checking for a good laying pattern. I'm looking for a big population of bees. If that's the case, I'm in for a lot of work. They can bring a lot of honey money my way. Okay, this is a new, a small version of a larger hive. It contains five frames, which you'll see in a second. And this is what I just used to feed them. So I'll show you inside. This hive was created from another split that got two full, so I took one frame out. What I wanted to do basically is start them raising their own queen. See the difference in the two bees? One's black and one's a little brown. In the hive, you have many different races of bees because the queen bee mates with 20 different males. All the bees in their sisters, even though there's one queen, eggs that she lay come from many different fathers. So sometimes in the hive, you'll see bees that all look different. Light brown, dark brown, black. You get about 500 bees per frame. It's not full, so it's probably a little less. And maybe about 300 there. But if you have five frames of 500, that's you know, about 2,000, 2,500. The honey is this capped off stuff out there. So five frames full of bees, full of nectar, full of pollen. When the bees start to multiply in numbers. You can take this and put it into a 10 frame, a larger size. I'm definitely scientifically minded. When you do grafting of queens and rearing queens, picking out a larvae at a certain stage and transferring it over, there's something that's really got me um, inspired. You know, and when you get one hive, you want two. When you get two, you want five. Next thing you want 10. Next thing you're up at night dreaming about it, you know? So it really becomes pretty addictive pretty fast. I like styrofoam because it's apparently better in the winter, warmer in the winter and cooler in the summer. In the spring, the bees start to multiply in numbers and we get lots of swarms. After that swarming period, the bees start to emerge and you get a good population of bees. This is called the inner cover and it allows the bees just to ventilate. So all of these bees are pretend to be the older bees and they'll be the ones circulating the air. Right there you'll see some bees that are receiving. So if a bee goes out and gets nectar, it'll stop at the front and they'll transfer the nectar from the other one. That one will go back out. And then of course there's the guard bees. But unless you don't bang on the hive and create a real threat, they'll be pretty docile. You know? If you go to a hive that's dry and you open it up, the bees would be just so mad. And basically what keeps them unhappy is when they feel a threat. So if you have machinery around, lots of vibrations around, anything that bumps or knocks the hive, it definitely will cause them to be in a state of panic. But if you have lots of food there, the bees are happy, everyone's happy, you just open up the hive like we did. That's why I have my little bottle. I feed mine with sugar during the death, just to keep them happy, you know, just to keep the queen laying her eggs, things like that, just to keep them maintained. A good beekeeper is one who spends a lot of time with their bees. Uh, they manage their bees well, they keep on top of their bees. There's other beekeepers out there that are very meticulous and they keep their hive wear immaculate. So you got to keep on top of it, not to stay away from your bees too long. Take the honey off when the honey is ready. I wouldn't classify myself as a great beekeeper. I'm an okay beekeeper. Usually it's just a time factor that's involved in it to be uh, really good at it. You have to be able to spend the time doing it. Mr. Ferber would call those beehavers. I'm probably in that beehaver as opposed to a good beekeeper at the moment. And the thing with beekeeping and beekeepers, there's no two beekeepers that are exactly alike. In fact, you can ask every beekeeper what is the best way to light your smoker? Something very basic. And if you ask five beekeepers, you're gonna get five different answers. And it's gonna be the same way with keeping bees. What works for one beekeeper doesn't necessarily work for another beekeeper. So beekeepers work or do what they're comfortable and what works for them. The reason we have a smoker is because smoke calms the bees. It actually makes them want to eat honey which 
is an all right thing, I guess. If they're calm and they're eating the honey, then you can give and take. Beekeepers use all different things for the smoker. Ferbert taught me to use burlap just because it's readily available. I think banana leaves are said to be calming. Anything free is basically the thing. But certain things will anger the bees. They don't like the smell of it. So you want like a white, thick, cool smoke. If the smoke is hot, you'll basically burn the wings of the bees. And that's not the idea. Okay. So, let's see, I've got my smoker and my hive tool. We're gonna go in. So first, you get your smoker nice and smoky. And you smoke the entrance because that's where the guard bees are. Throughout a hive, every bee has a different job. Some of them right now are guard bees. Some of them are going out and foraging. Some are taking care of the baby bees, taking care of the queen. There's all kinds of different jobs bees do, and they're amazing creatures. So now, I'm gonna open up the top. As a beekeeper, you always wanna be very gentle and try not to bang things around or uh, you know, make a lot of noise and vibration. These are supers right here, this box. It has 10 frames, which look like this. This is a brand new frame with just a wax foundation on it. The bees have glands on their bellies that excrete wax. So they take the wax from their bodies and gradually draw out the comb. Everything in the hive basically is naturally created thanks to bees. And the only reason we have frames like this and boxes is to make it easier as a commercial beekeeper to get the honey out. If you didn't do this, the bees would just build their comb and create the honey, make the honey, and you would have honey to harvest. It would just be more difficult. So this is the brood chamber. The deep super on the bottom is where we keep the queen. Right here, I have a queen excluder. This we put on top of this box, this super, and it keeps the queen below it. She can't get up through it, but the other bees are just small enough that they can, so they can go up to the top, upper levels. So this is a frame full of bees. And in the middle area, there's capped brood, and there are larvae that are not capped. But if you look very closely at some of the cells, you can see a tiny little white dot in the bottom. That's like a day-old egg. And also, if you look at these cells here that are like rounded at the top, those are drone brood cells, capped drone brood. Drones are the male bees, and drones actually don't sting, which is kind of nice. <laughs> these are bees that are taking care of the young, which is like one of the most important functions. It's a nice full frame of bees. So when we go to hives at the end of the season, we want to see it like that, because that's a finished product. They can't do anything else with that. That has to come in to be extracted. It takes us between the 15th of October to the end of November, depending on the weather. If the weather's like this, we're all day working at getting it extracted. But it's no good to me on, on the hives. I leave some for the bees, but it needs to come off if it's capped and ready to go. The supers would come in off the van, and they'd be put in this tray. And that tray is designed to take about maybe 50 of these supers, so they get piled up here, a little ton of honey. Then a couple of guys will be working on, on capping. So we bring the supers and put them on here. This here pops the frame from the supers and they're taken out. And what we do is uncap them. We take the wax off the face of the comb. The wax comes right off and it falls in here. This is all bees wax. So after we take the wax off the face of these frames, they're put into the extractor. And this extractor holds 36 frames 
and they're all put in here like so. And by centrifugal force, the honey is whipped out. And with that action, the honey is coming out of the combs. It falls into here. And then it's pumped. All the, it's pumped all the way up to a filter up here. It goes through a fine cloth like you see hanging there just to pick up any bits of wax. So when it ends up in any one of these barrels, it's nice and clean and clear. When that gets full, that's 500 gallons. And somebody can sit on the end there and just bottle all day and all night. This here is a heater. During December and January it gets cold. So in order to bottle it, it can be bottled, but it takes a long time and the honey is very cool. So we just warm it up so it can, it runs real smooth and quick. So we'll move the belt to each barrel when I'm ready. So I can get it in the drum so I can get it bottled and get it to the shops so and get it to the bank. And then while that's saddling and pumping, we're getting another 36 ready. This beeswax gets saved and it gets melted down by a solar wax melter. The beeswax is very, very, very valuable. It's worth four times as much as the honey, actually. So we save that, and when it's processed, it's put in various blocks like this here, and there's lots of blocks up there, and it's used for soap, beeswax polish, hand creams, all kinds of things. The bees make beeswax from the wax glands. It comes off the bodies in liquid form and they fan it and fan it. That's an amazing feature. It just blows my mind how they make that. It really does. They make a lot of it real quick if they have a lot of food coming in. This is honeycomb. We do honeycomb as well. That's just the way the bees make it. A lot of people like the, eating the honey right out of the comb. The best honey I ever had comes from a little country called Bermuda. Our honey has a unique taste because our flowers are all so varied. The bees are working on a variety of vegetation, so we get a unique Bermuda taste. Bermuda honey is the way it is because there's no way to get the bees to just take nectar from one type of flower. In the States, they have a field five miles across that you put the hive in the middle and they can only fly in that field. But Bermuda honey is just such a mixture of different things. So whatever's blooming from month to month, that's what they're eating, and that's what our honey is made of. We're so lucky. The only way in Bermuda, I guess, to get a certain taste is if you knew, say, June is when bay grape is blooming, and you take off the honey before that blooms, and then take it off right after it finishes, then you get more of a bay grape flavor. But basically, if you let something go to flower, Usually the bees will be like, yes, <laughs> like Mexican pepper, Brazilian pepper, and they have kind of the same taste of honey, a mild, lovely honey. Rosemary, all the things in your garden, if you let them flower, bees love it. So this is the honey from my two hives that the bees disappeared from. I luckily saved it from the ants. So this is minimally filtered and definitely not heated honey. If you filter it too finely, the pollens and stuff that are in honey naturally, you basically filter them out and that's part of what's really good for you. Honey contains all the things from the flowers but also bacteria, just like in yogurt, that are probiotic. And the more you heat it or filter it, the more you kill that off or eliminate it. So. I don't know if you can see, but it's got a little bit of flex, I guess, of like pollens and stuff. Depending on what flowers the bees went to, it can be medicinal in different ways. Obviously, different plants have different properties that are useful to us, and the honey takes on those properties as well. The longer it's left on the hive, the darker it gets. Honey darkens with age. If you look at Randolph Herbert's collection, there's honeys there from way, way back, and they're all black as night. So if you see dark honey, often it's just because it's older. But it also can have to do with the type of flowers that it came from. 
So this is a very special jar of honey. This year, for the first time, we've been able to do what's called varietal honey. And basically what you do is you separate out the honey by variety. And in one of my hives, I noticed that when the pit of swarm was in flower, the bees were collecting the nectar from it and capping it off. So I was able to do my best guess, um, and you can taste it and verify it, that this tastes very similar to pit of swarm. So this is, um, of course, nothing added to it, but pit of swarm honey made in Bermuda. Um, most of the honey that we do, we do get seasonally. Um, most of the time, you know, beekeepers, well, Mr. Fervent harvest twice a year. Um, at the timing of the fiddlewood is the first one, and then the second one is the timing of the Mexican pepper. But this year, because I was in, my, in the hive and doing courses and in, in the hive more frequently, I was able to keep a track on, you know, the bees producing this pit of swarm honey, and I was able to take it out at a time um, to, to separate it out. So that's a variety of honey. Pit of sperm honey. It comes out a lot lighter than what you normally see in the, um, the grocery store. Mexican pepper comes out, you know, a lot dark, and that tends to be our main crop. Right now, we're fighting with diseases. We have a varroa mite, which preys on the female bees and sucks their blood to the point where they die. We're still working on it. But I've lost a third of my bees or maybe more than that. So there's not going to be much honey around for Christmas this year. But I'm thankful for past years. Last year and year before, I had so much honey. It's just a bumper year. Last year, I estimated we did about four tons of honey. All those barrels had been filled. This year, there's nothing to speak about at all. We didn't get any April showers. We didn't get any May rain. We didn't get any June rain. We didn't get any rain until cup match. And after the hurricane, the vegetation was all burnt, and the ants thought what was left was theirs. So we had an infestation of ants like you never would believe it. And they just drove a lot of the bees right out of the hives. This is my last remaining honey that I, I have until my honey, my bees produce honey again. All my bees died off since the varroa mite was found. So the three hives that I currently have, I um, captured this year. So I'm just starting all over again, starting from scratch. I found three swarms, and so I have three going now, and I'm hoping to keep these going so I get a little bit of honey maybe sometime in the fall. The most I had was 16 hives, and that was plenty for me because uh, pretty much I was doing it you know, by myself, uh, and so it was a lot of work involved uh, just keeping uh, 16 hives. And so the honey was enough just to give away as Christmas presents, but over the last year and a half, all my hives died off. We have been very fortunate here with our bees. You know, some of the beekeepers in the U.S. have lost literally tens of thousands of hives in a short period of time. And that's something that's very difficult to imagine that, you know, your livelihood is, is can be wiped out in, in a matter of uh, weeks. But yet speaking to those guys and still listening to the passion they have for it and the love of bees, it just keeps them going and just drives them forward uh, to keep on going, get more bees and, you know, start all over again. The Bermuda government is trying to work very closely with the beekeeping association to try and uh, mitigate the varroa mite. When the, it was first discovered, around November 2009, we did an island-wide survey to see how far was the varroa mite found in Bermuda. And it was island-wide, and that was literally uh, within the week after it was discovered. So saying that, it was here for a little while before the discovery it had to be, to be found island-wide like that. The next thing that we try to do is to determine what the population was like. Was it high density of uh, varroa mite or was it low levels? And we were finding in some hives that the numbers were extremely high in comparison to what we've heard from some of our counterparts overseas. So we knew that we had a, a problem, you know, on our hands. I think we have a good chance of getting this mite problem under control and at least helping or saving the beekeeping industry. Um, the beekeepers also have done a fantastic job in uh, doing and helping themselves as well. So they're certainly a, a strength uh, amongst themselves. These are my two hives. I have, I did have four, but they definitely showed signs of varroa mites. So um, with the help of Tommy Sinclair and another beekeeper, I put on a treatment to lower the levels of varroa mites. And unfortunately, 
it had a negative effect. And I'm pretty sure my bees are somewhere in this marsh, uh, making a natural hive, probably. This is a formic acid strip. And when you put that on, the fumes kill the varroa, but they also are enough to drive the bees out of the hive, which I don't think is really supposed to happen. The two here are alive and kicking, as you can see, and hopefully going to bring in some honey pretty soon when the Mexican pepper comes online. Varroa, because they breed in the bees' larvae, often they're most able to be seen on the nurse bees' backs. In Bermuda, I would say beekeeping so far has been much easier because up until this year, we didn't have any real problems with parasites or diseases too much. We have American fowl brood, which is one disease that is pretty bad when you get it, but it's nothing compared to varroa mites, which is changing already the way we keep bees. So now I would say keeping bees is probably about the same difficulty as elsewhere. But yeah, beekeeping is fun and without varroa. <laughs> In the U.S., they've had a varroa mite for over 20 years, and so there's a lot of beekeepers who have been treating for it and using different chemicals, and they've been able to keep the mite population down. Now, this is a mite that came into uh, a new country where there have been no treatments at all at the time where the mites were found. So, you know, they, I guess they just were able to flourish because there was no controls for them, and so they kind of just took off, um, and you know, that's kind of where we are now. And we're looking for different ways to control the mites because a lot of beekeepers don't want to use chemicals in their hives if they don't have to. There are chemicals that are registered as organic chemicals and so uh, would have very little uh, effect on the, the bee, the hive, uh, the wax or the honey. But still, it's the thought of having to put chemicals in your hive. You know, what you're actually doing is you're treating an insect that lives on an insect. So it's, it's a very difficult thing to do. So there are other methods out there. And some people have been using a method called the drone brood removal, where beekeepers actually would physically go in there every 24 days and remove all the drone brood, and along with that, the varroa mite. Uh, because the mites are more apt to lay on the male bees or the drones than the females. The cell size is a lot larger and it, it just so happens that you know, they're more attracted to that size cell. So you, what you're doing is you're controlling the mite population by removing it. And that's another way to do it. Um, as I said, we're trying to stay away from uh, chemicals as much as possible. We even recently brought in a beekeeper, Dr. John Harbo. He discovered a type of bee that shows a hygienic behavior that actually, uh, when the bee detects the mite in the hive, in the larva now, it will actually remove that larva with the mites on it and deposit it outside the hive. He came down to have a look at our bees and to see if something like that would work. Seems like it would work, but right now the bees, thankfully, seem to be bouncing back from the sharp decline that we had uh, last year. I don't think the mite will ever be eradicated from Bermuda. That would literally mean going out and killing every single bee on the island. Uh, and that's probably not practical, and you're probably not going to be able to do it. And then after that, you'd have to import new bees to the island. So the with doing that as well is you don't know what you will be importing, especially when you're talking that volume of bees. So the best that we can do is to try to live with the mite, try to control the number of mites in the hive so we can still keep bees. So at the moment we're really on like a holding pattern to see what happens uh, this year. Um, hopefully we don't have the sharp decline like we did last year. So right now we're faced with the mystery of are our bees dying from varroa or are they just dying from starvation from the lack of food and flowers or now that we have varroa we have more viruses so they could be dying from that right now we're just trying to figure out what the bees are dying from we have to wait i guess to see when the honey flow comes on which hopefully it will soon do the bees build back up and even if they do we've lost over half of the hives on the island and that means there's a lot of building up to do. So we're looking at bringing in queens, which beekeepers haven't done in a long time. And we're lucky that we haven't had all these viruses that the US has and other places, which Varroa carries. 
and we hope that however we got Varroa, the Varroa wasn't carrying too many of these viruses. And when we bring in queens, we don't want to bring in more viruses, basically. I think like anything, a crisis brings people together. And the Varroa might, even though it's the worst thing that could have happened to the bees, it's almost the best thing that could, that could have happened because now, as opposed to having all of the knowledge in beekeeping around a few central people, that knowledge is being able to be disseminated. And you have you know, people who are interested having the avenue to, to um, suss out that interest, as opposed to being interested and having nothing to do with it. So having the courses, having the knowledge transfer, having all of that, and people interested, gives people the, the ability to take on some of that knowledge and pass it on to others. If you listen to the news, you'll find it's a problem in the states, all over the states, all over Canada, in Europe, in Britain, they've lost lots of their bees. But avid beekeepers will still go back in because they love bees and try to get going again when the spring comes. And not just for honey production, but for food production. No bees, no honey, no work, no money, no food, no apples and oranges. Everyone out there that has a property, the local homeowners, uh, one thing that they could also do to help the local bees is to plant bee-friendly plants. A lot of times people are very quick to cut down Mexican pepper and the fiddlewood trees. Though they are a very invasive tree, if they could keep them under control, then that would help to solve some of the issues. But the bees, um, the bees do make a good crop of honey off of these. Even some of the weeds that people have in their gardens, like the fennel, you know, some things like the, the little match weed that we see. Bees will visit those quite often. And so if people plant bee-friendly plants, things that do flower, and you can get a list of them from either myself or from one of the nursery supplies. I'm sure they can help you out as well uh, with different uh, bee-friendly plants. Anything I plant, I plant for the bees. Anything to help the bees helps the beekeeper. I would like to have thought that I could have found somebody really interested to want to get involved and keep it going because I've built up a big beekeeping empire which now trying to decide what I should do with it. Uncle Randolph taught me definitely to love beekeeping. He loves beekeeping and I don't know I guess all beekeepers I think end up with their own style and their own things that they think are important about keeping bees, why they do it. It's a hard, hard job. I think I've injured myself like, I don't know, 10 times. Like I said, you have to carry, I think, 40 pound, sometimes more maybe, boxes of honey with bees flying all around you trying to sting you. But that said, I think it's definitely worth a try, especially because Uncle Randolph is 80 or thereabouts and probably gonna give it up soon and there's only a few other beekeepers especially now that we have Varroa it's harder now there's a lot of opportunity if you need work you could be a beekeeper it was uh, <laughs> a laugh a minute <laughs> Although I'm still interested in bees, I come down here and wonder what I'm going to do next. So I'm getting old and trying to wind down out of it. I really am. I'm becoming an older man now. Much older than people think. And it's extremely hard work. But I always gravitate towards hard work. Because I realized many years ago that if you don't work hard, you don't succeed. And success only comes before work in the dictionary. I've been keeping bees for 38 years. It's like any other business. You have some losses, but I think about the good years I've had. I've been blessed with good years. You have to have a love for it. You really do. Anybody can keep bees, but you have to have a real love for those girls. You see. Just to hear the buzzing and the, and the noise, it sounds really melodious. <laughs> Man 
many, many years ago, they used to sing and dance all the way from Somerset to St. Jude. They used to sing and dance as they went along, singing a happy but a teasing kind of song. What they singing, man? They go like. All the way from Mangrove Bay, that's where all the old maids stay. All the way to Crow Lane Cider, nothing there but foolish pride. What you say? point half a gallon and half a pint all the way to Devonshire Point brackish water and rotten corn man you say that's funny man they used to sing and dance as they went along yes singing a happy but a teasing kind of song. Ah, ha, 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 yeah, man. 